Thank God for his faithfulness. Praise the Lord for his faithfulness. God does in our lives in various ways. I'm going to just start by sharing a blessing. Uh, as you know, I use my iPad for my sermons. It's right there. And it started acting up. I mean, my iPad has been around the world. And um, some people have said, do you trust that device? What if it just dies on you in the middle of your sermon? And uh, I've responded, if it dies on me in the middle of my sermon, as long as my Bible still lives, I'll be okay. But it was acting up, and I took it down to the Verizon store, and <laughs> we saw Bob and, and Alice there. And we had our, our electronic stories we were trading with each other. And I said to Angie, I said, you know, I've got to get this thing switched out. Her iPod, her iPad died this week. We haven't had a funeral for it yet because we're hoping that it will get one more breath to get those important documents off of it. But it died. And I took her and got her one. But I went to the, I, to the Verizon store and I was looking at this newer iPad and I thought, wow, I really want one of those so badly, but I just am not really ready to go into my pocket for that. And I said, I don't want to replace my iPad. And they said, okay, well, you have insurance, so we could do that. But they went in the back and they couldn't find any. And the guy said, well, we have bad news for you. Uh, we don't have any, we don't have any more of those. But we have good news for you. You might be happy about the good news. We're going to give you the newer generation, brand new. And Angie said, just minutes ago, you were standing right in front of that iPad saying, boy, I'd sure love to have one of those. So my new year started off with a new iPad. And I'm using my iPad for the glory of God. Come on, somebody, say amen. So when I say that my Redeemer is faithful and true, it's not... It's not um, It's not a hearsay, it's an experience. That's why I've been encouraged. The sermon title is, Why Settle for Less? Why Settle for Less? The scripture reading comes from one of the most contrasting texts in the Bible. There are many texts. Romans 6, verse 23 is one. John three sixteen is another. John 10.10 10 is another. A contrasting scripture is one that shows the side of God and the side of the enemy in the same passage. The ways of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, the contrast. This is one of those contrasting ones, which is the foundation of our message. And then we're going to transition into Matthew 19. Well, let's read this together. I'd like to encourage you to read this with me. The Bible reads thus far together. The thief does not come except to do what? Steal together, kill, and what else? Destroy. But what does the Lord say? But I have come that they may have life and that they may have it how? More abundantly. This is not going to be a motivational sermon. This is going to be a sermon that really taps you into a foundation that never fails, a building that never cracks, and a God that never disappoints. A foundation that never fails, a building that never cracks, and a God that never disappoints. Bow your heads with me. Loving Father in heaven, we catapult ourselves into the new year, and I know I'm dating this message, but I do it intentionally. Because there are opportunities for us to begin again. And this is one. Now speak to your people. And may we consider deeply that we don't have to settle for less when we serve you, the king of everything. Speak to our hearts, we pray now, in the worthy and blessed name of Jesus. And may the message find in us a place where it can plant the seed, that seed can be nurtured, and 2020 can be a year of untold blessings in the presence and in the midst of the challenges of life. In Jesus' name I pray. 
Amen. If you have your Bibles, go to Matthew chapter 19. We are going to consider a story that is of such level of importance that Matthew, Mark, and Luke were inspired by the Holy Spirit to preserve it. You know, there are certain messages that need to be preserved, and there are certain things in our walk as Christians that we are so glad that God does not preserve. But this is one of those accounts in the Bible that we are glad that God preserved it. When it's of such a level of importance that Matthew, Mark, and Luke include it, then we know that God has given each one of these Bible writers a tax collector, an underdog preacher, Mark, and Luke, a doctor. From a doctor's perspective, from a former tax collector's perspective, and from Mark, he's referred to as the, the apostle, the disciple to the underdogs. He always tries to bring out the possibilities that we can become better. He leans himself in the direction of the person who doesn't seem that he or she feels their worth. And so all three of them consider the implications and the applications of this wonderful story. In Matthew 19, you find that Jesus was about to be confronted by a well-educated ruler. But what the, what the ruler didn't take into account is he was about to be confronted by someone that did not need education. Someone that knew everything. And I want to begin by saying, does it ever dawn on you that there is never a day that God says, I need to learn that? Come on, somebody. There's never a day that God wakes up and says, I need to learn that. As much as we think we are advanced, we are nothing but tiny little ants on a grain of sand called earth thinking we own something when the God who suspends worlds without strings and magnetic devices never wakes up in the morning and says, wow, an iPad, never thought about that. Megahertz and gigahertz and all the things that we use in our modern terminology have all been in the laboratory of God ever since forever. And we've just found a very practical way to harness what God has made available. As I remember, I forgot who said it, but it may have been Danny. He said, do you realize that in the book of Genesis, everything that was needed to make an airplane existed in the very beginning. We just didn't have the knowledge on how to do it. Because well, the wise man Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. But this young, well-educated ruler with great possessions was about to be confronted by the only one in existence that did not need an education. And we pick up the story in Matthew 19, and we look together at verse 16. I hope you have your Bibles, but if you don't, we are going to help you out by including it on our screen. And I appreciate our audiovisual team very much. Matthew 19 Verse 16, the Bible says, Now behold, one came and said to him. Now, I'll give you the foundation. When the Bible says, Now behold, one came, the actual setting is one young man came running to Jesus. He didn't casually approach Christ. He came to him. He came to him with intent. He came to him with purpose. So when the Bible says one came, he came with his eyes focused, he didn't bump into Jesus in a crowd and said, oh, by the way, he came with his intent fixed on Christ. Something drew him to Christ. Something about Jesus said to him, if there's somebody you need to talk to, he's the man. Have you ever heard about that before? People have said, if you want to get a job, that's who you need to talk to. If you want to get that car, I know exactly what, what dealership to go to. If you want a really good bank loan at a low interest, this is the institution you need to consider. Let me tell you something. In Jesus Christ, we can get the best interest rate, the best bank loan, and the best job in history. Come on, help me out, somebody. He saw in Christ everything he desired, and he ran to him with the question, good teacher, or as the King James Version says, good master. What good thing shall I do that I may have, what did he want, friends? Eternal life. 
what good thing should I do? And right off the bat, the question that this ruler asked Jesus immediately puts the transaction of salvation on the basis of individual works. He said, what do I need to do? Tell me what I need to do in order to have eternal life. And the inference is, I'll be willing to do it. But what he failed to realize is there's nothing that we can do, and that is in a logistic sense, we can't sing better, we can't preach better, we can't save enough money, we can't have the highest position in life. There's nothing that we can do logistically that can contribute to eternal life because eternal life is a gift of God. Now, I want you to get this. It's not a gift from God. It is the gift of God. What's the difference? I can give you something. That's a gift. But I give you, if I give you myself, I am the gift. Jesus didn't give us a gift. He gave us himself. Didn't that, wasn't that the statement that the prophets made concerning the coming of Christ? Behold, call his name Emmanuel, meaning what? God with us. So when the Bible says salvation, it is a gift of God, not of works. It is God giving himself through the person of Jesus. He's extending himself. He's not just giving gifts. Anybody could give a gift from a distance, but when the gift is of such value that he sends the gift embodied in an individual, you know that that's not just an ordinary gift. God says, I need to send myself in the person of my son. That's why Jesus responded to this young ruler with the same word the young ruler used. Good. Look at verse 17. So he said to him, why do you call me good? Why do you call me good? No one is good, but how many? One, that is God. So let's pause there for a brief moment. I'll give you the last part of the text. What in fact is being said here, the ruler called Jesus good when according to the Jewish Talmud, the word good is never used except only as it relates to God. So here is Jesus on the earth, already many confrontations with the Pharisees and the scribes and the religious leaders of which he is a part of that sect. So now he calls Jesus good, and Jesus, when he responds, why do you call me good? There's none good but one. Jesus capitalizes on a moment by saying, wait a minute. He is of the very same sect the very same group of individuals that denied my divinity, and they never call me good because they would not call anybody good but God, but this young man who is a part of that very sect calls me good. So wait a minute. I want to take advantage of this opportunity and hopefully get one of the leaders to publicly acknowledge my divinity. That's why he said, there's nobody good but God. got to be seeing him, in him that Jesus is in a position that was openly denied by the other rulers, but a ruler comes along and gives him the title that according to their own Talmud should never be used except when you are talking to God. And he calls him good master, good teacher. Oh, am I good? Well, then I must be God. This was an opportunity for Jesus to confirm his divinity. That's why he said what he did. Furthermore, when he said to him in the latter part of the verse, but if you want to enter into life, what did he end by saying? The last three words. Say it together. Keep the commandments. The reason why he said that, once again, from a Jewish perspective, the commandments have never been disconnected from salvation. Let me say that again. Honoring and living in harmony with the commandments of God have never been disconnected from salvation. When we are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone, we are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone, but do we make God's law void through faith? And Paul the Apostle reminds us by saying, certainly not. If we, if we are saved, if we are in a relationship with Christ, we don't ignore the commandments of God because we have faith. 
Matter of fact, look at Deuteronomy 5 and verse 29. And once again, this is significant. Jesus is responding to a Jewish man, a young man, in the very language that he understands because he has been trained in this area. So Jesus goes back to Deuteronomy 5 and verse 29. He says, Oh, that they had such a heart in them. This is a text this young man knows. He knows this. So when the Lord said commandments, this immediately comes into his training. Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and always keep my what? Commandments. That it may be well, always keep all my commandments. That it may be well with them and with their children. So you find in this young man's life, he was raised, my wife and I, we were in Jerusalem. We went by the Wailing Wall. Um, some of you have been there before. And um, you couldn't go to the Wailing Wall without a yarmulke. And the women and the men were separated. The women were on this side, and the wall separated the women from the men. The same way it is in the Jewish synagogue when they get together and worship. That's why the Apostle Paul, there's a text that often is misunderstood when the Apostle Paul says, if a woman wants to learn something, let her ask her husband when she's at home. And some people have taken that text to believe that women can't speak in church and they can't talk in church. That's not what it meant. In the Jewish synagogues, even still to this very day, if the synagogue has a downstairs and upstairs, the women sit upstairs and the men sit downstairs. If it's large enough, the men sit on the left, the women sit on the right. And in many instances, there's a curtain that separates the two. Even on an airplane, a Jewish man, a religious Jewish man, will not sit next to a woman on the plane that's not his wife. That created a stir on one of the American Airlines flights. Uh, could you get me another seat? Well, sir, your seat is 29A but she's not my wife, and I'm not sitting next to her. And they religiously moved his seat. So when the Lord is talking about commandments here, he is in essence saying, this is something you understand. So when Paul says, ask when you get home, in order for the woman to understand anything in the setting of the, of the, of the tabernacle or the sanctuary where they worshiped, is she had to ask the husband during the sermon, what did, the, what did the rabbi mean by that? And it would interrupt the service. That's the only reason why the Apostle Paul says, if you need to ask your husband anything, ask him when you get home. So like if Bob was over there and Alice was over here and Alice asked Bob, it immediately interrupts the service. Don't yell it out loud. So that's why Matthew 19, verse 18 and 19 stimulated a natural reaction from the Jewish ruler. He knew the commandments. So Jesus dove in right away. Look at verse 19, 18 and the 20. Verses 18 to verse 20. Jesus went ahead and went right for the things that he understood very clearly. He began to give him samples of the commandments. And each of the commandments that Jesus gives him all point to relationships. Points to what? Relationships, relationships. relationships between one another. He did not include any of the first four commandments. But by not including them, he was not giving him license to violate any of them either because there was no issue among the Jews. He said to him in verse 18, he said to him, which ones? That's what the young man said. And Jesus said in verse, continued, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not be a false witness, honor your father and your mother. And then he brings in Matthew chapter 22. You shall love your neighbor as what? yourself. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept from my youth. What do I still lack? What he didn't understand, and I'm getting to the foundation here of why settle for less. What he didn't understand was Jesus was about to take him to the deeper level. The issue in his life, as it is in our lives, the issue in his life wasn't the real, it wasn't about the Ten Commandments. It was a deep-seated issue that Jesus slowly... What I like about Jesus, when he meets a person, he doesn't immediately say, are you a vegan? <laughs> Amen. He seeks to change the life. And when the life is changed, the things of a changed life becomes more 
if I could use the word palatable, more acceptable. He doesn't say the moment he meets a person, do you keep the Sabbath? No. He seeks to win that individual's confidence and heart. He seeks to show that person love and patience and gratitude and kindness. And by winning that individual, he's getting slowly to the deeper level. Look at the stories in the Bible, and you'll find in every case, in every instance, when Jesus had a one-to-one -one conversation, he always got to the deeper issue slowly. He could have told this young man from the very beginning, you know, your problem is you don't like other people. But he said, let me start where I know he and I could connect. Learn that principle. When you converse with people, start where you can connect. Do it. Connect kindly. Amen, somebody? Amen. Connect kindly. Don't connect theologically and try to be the proof texter in the beginning. That's why tonight's Vespers is going to be powerful. You cannot afford to miss it. I'm telling you now. I'll show you how to bring out the best in your Bible study. So he begins now. And when you look at the story, there was nothing wrong with the question that the young man asked. But the issue was the answer. Look at verse 21. Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, <laughs> I'm always amazed when I meet Christians that Spent a whole lot of time talking about perfection. If you want to be perfect, what's the first word? Go. Go. Sell what you have and give to the poor. Now, let me not run past that very quickly because I, I want you to understand the, 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 the foundation for what we're talking about of purposeful balance. In order for us, one of the first principles of purposeful balance is you have to be willing to get rid of what you have to make room for what God has. That's the first principle of living a balanced life because you could only get so much into a trailer, a trailer truck. You could only get so much into any container. What in essence the Lord is saying is you need to make room in your life where, where right now there's really not any room. So how much room did he need to make? How much room did he need to make? What did he say to him? Go sell what you have. Did he say how much? When you look at the other Bible writers, sell all. Get rid of everything you have. And I'm going to tell you, I don't know if you think about this or not, but it's really tough. If you meet somebody and they say, well, we want to give you something. But the first principle is you got to get rid of everything you have. And, they, and you say to them, um, what do you mean everything? Everything you have. Get rid of everything you have. Well, what do you mean everything? Everything. Is there anything? Can I, can I keep anything? No. Get rid of how many things? Everything. Now, that's a, that's a shock. If somebody walked up to you and said that, Ramona, what would you say? Everything? Now, you know what? The reality of it is, let's, let, me, let me flip on you here. The reality of it is, Everything we have, say that with me, everything we have, we will leave behind one day. How many things? Everything. everything we have. I may have told you this, but it fits right now. Does anybody know what the micro SD card is? There's SD, then there's micro SD. That's that one that if you drop it, you're not going to find it for another hour. It's really small. It's like a, it's like a, it's like a communion bread that's emaciated. It's really small. It's tiny. It's smaller than a piece of communion cracker. We were sitting down in one of the hotels. <laughs> Don't remember where it was. But I was putting a micro SD card in some device, maybe a camera, and I dropped it on the floor and I picked it up and I was sitting there looking at it. And I just said, what are you, why are you looking at it like that? I said, do you realize we can't even take that to heaven with us? A micro SD chip. We can't even take that to heaven with us. Now, there's a reason I'm coming at you this early, is because one of the problems of the world in which we live, the world in which we live has conditioned us, especially in the holiday season, to get all you can because really you will be happy when you get everything you want. 
And people are so unhappy with some of the things they get that I was looking at the news and they said, the biggest day outside of Christmas Day is the day after when people that are discontent that they didn't get what they want return billions of dollars. That's why the stores now ask you when you buy something for somebody, would you like a what? Gift receipt. But I want to tell you today, the one gift I will never return is the gift of salvation. But this world has taught us, did you get what you want for Christmas? Well, I got another tie, and I got like 900 ties. Don't need another tie. So we take it back. I've often said, if it's a gift, keep it. Except if you have five blenders or three vacuum cleaners, you don't really need it. So that's the whole point. The Lord is saying to him, young man, everything you have, if you really want eternal life, you got to let it go anyhow. So you might as well begin now. But not only get rid of what you have, give it to somebody else. That's a revolutionary idea. And then he says, which seems odd to think at the moment of transaction, here you are emptying your house and putting your bed, your computer, your television, your wardrobe, your 185 pairs of shoes, your laptop, your... You're putting it in the back of all these trailers in your front yard, and in the back of your mind, you're saying, I hope, I hope what he's going to give me is better than what I have now. You following the picture? You're emptying your house, and he says, ah, 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 ah. Now do the shed. Ah, the attic. The basement. Come on now, that secret panel behind your wall, you know I could see behind that thing too. Everything. And then you say, okay. He said, oh, I forgot to tell you, your house too. Now, uh, so this reality starts to sink into this young man because not only is he young and he's a ruler, he has a lot of stuff. The next verse reveals the point where the sermon, where the focus is born. Look at verse 22, the verse 22. But when the young man heard that saying, when he heard, when he heard about the price for eternal life, when he heard about the command of Christ, the Bible said, he went away how? Sorrowful, for he had what? Great possessions. Now, let me break down four very important points. Allow me to expand on why the rich young ruler walked away. Here's why he walked away. The Bible said he had great possessions. Let me expand on that. He had great possessions, but his great possessions had him. You find in many of the challenges that we face in life is not what we have, but it's what has us. And you might say, I don't have great possessions. But when you begin to break this down, he traded life for things that have no life. Okay. <laughs> Got me a new case. Samsung case. Samsung phone. Note 10 plus, 5G. The Lord says, get rid of it. Well, how am I going to make phone calls? He's saying, you know why I want you to get rid of it? Because it's between you and me. I know some of you are probably holding on to your phone tighter now. <laughs> if the Lord told this generation to get rid of just their phone. I could feel your pulse speeding up right now. I could see the expression, my what, Lord? I stood in front of two young ladies down in Florida a couple of years ago when we did camp meeting. Down in Florida, I forgot where it was. Nice big church, we did a camp meeting in the winter. <coughs> there was these two young ladies, two young girls, they were teenagers. And they came to me and they said, we watch your series. How girls do, we watch your series. 
on unclean spirits. It was nice. Pastor, it was real nice. They said, that was, that was deep. They were, you know, using the young words like like and deep. That, I mean, I like that was deep, like, like deep. And I said, do you want to have that kind of experience? He said, we sure would. I said, our child, do this. Don't, don't listen. Don't put your phone down for one week. I saw a teenage attitude. They said, And they walked away silently. No further comment necessary. Now, while we're thinking about that, it is humorous to think about, but when our possessions have us, the possession is greater than the things that we possess. When we don't have the, the conscious intellect to not allow a device or a job or a relationship or anything that we own or anything that is in our sphere of impact or influence, when we allow anything in our sphere of impact or influence to be of a higher priority than eternal life, something is wrong. Something is seriously wrong. And this generation above all others this last generation has been flooded. What word did I just use? Flooded. <laughs> you know why I know? Because I'm one of them with stuff. I go through my house, and Angie and I, when trying, we want to unload stuff. I made the mistake and said that on television once, and I got a letter from somebody in Africa, and they said, mail me your stuff. I said, if you want my stuff, you have to come get it. Because I go through my drawer. Come on now. I go through my drawer, and I, find, I found a flip phone. A dinosaur. I found old, an old digital camera. The highest resolution was five megapixels. Techies, you know what I'm talking about, right? Old stuff. I found cords. You know, they make fools out of us with these cords. First it's USB, then it's USB 2, then it's USB 2.4, then it's USB 3 and 3.0 and 3.1. Then it has a connection that we can't connect, so we get an adapter for the connector that I can't connect, so that we can have three adapters to connect that cord to something that we can't connect it to anymore. And between the old device and the new device, we have three connectors to step grade right up and down. You get my point? We go from USB-C to USB 3.1, 3.2, 2.0. And we get every device, and we think, I am ready for life. And then we go overseas, and we realize, I forgot a cord. <laughs> and that one cord throws our life into a tizzy, a spin. We don't know what to do. I was in, I was in Jamaica just recently and, uh, at the camp meeting there in Northern, uh, North Jamaica Conference. And when I was done, this, the guys that run the audio, they said, oh, we have a request. Please give us that plug. I said, what plug? That plug. Because we can never buy that plug in Jamaica. Okay, I said, since you did such a good job, I'll give it to you. They said, we're not done. <laughs> we want that direct box. Now, that's foreign language to some of you ladies or men. A device that connects certain devices, to whatever. We want that too because we don't have that in this country. I said, well, I'm not giving you that. But here's how much it's going to cost you. They said, we'll give you whatever you ask because we can't get it. We don't know how blessed we are. We live in an Amazon Prime-driven society. Come on, somebody. Anybody Prime? Any Prime members? Leave your hands down. We could get stuff tomorrow. And if it doesn't come tomorrow, my package did not arrive. That's the society we live in. We are addicted. And if our Internet takes a minute to download something. We call frontier communications. My internet is slow. God knows me so well that he does not allow my internet to be more than three megabyte download. And for those of you that know what I mean, all around me there's fiber optics over here 12 megabyte down here in West Frankfurt, 120 megabyte download, and God put me on a street where I only get three megabytes download speed. Hurry up. 
Now, I'm talking technically right here, but I'm taking you somewhere. That's how we think. It's not fast enough. It's not efficient enough. And when we upgrade our phones, honestly, how many of us really need to upgrade our phones? We really don't. But we do it because we want to be on the cutting edge. iPhone people look and live. A Note 10 Plus. Don't trade life for things that don't have life. The greatest roadblock in this fast-paced generation is to spend time with a book that takes time. I'm, I'm going to say it again. You cannot afford to miss tonight, 4 o'clock, because I'm going to show you how you can restore the greatest joy with something that takes time. The Lord confronted that young man, and he said, the price for eternal life is this. He traded the eternal for the temporal. He realized that the reason why he was confronted and walked away sorrowfully is because the price for eternal life was higher than the price he was willing to pay. And the ironic thing about it, Gary, was this. Eternal life has already been paid for. Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, I just said it. Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Amen. That was the foundation. Now the sermon starts. Because the question is, why settle for less? Let's talk about things that will begin to immediately identify you. One of the many stories... This is one of the many stories in the Bible that modern psychologists call self-sabotage. What word did I just say? Self-sabotage. And this story describes this kind of self-sabotage. To be lost is horrendous, but to ignore salvation intentionally is unimaginable. That's why at the, out, at, the, at the last, when the curtain finally goes down, one of the reasons why there's going to be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth is because when the electricity has been cut off, when there's no more digital communication, when all satellites cease to function and all televisions cannot be turned on and everything we've surrounded ourselves with begins to not even speak to us, there will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth when the only thing that really mattered is not in our backpack. Salvation. Verse 23 and 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly I say to you, this is for sure, that it is hard for a rich man, and by the way, every one of us is rich in some capacity, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, that text has caused theological de debates. Some people say, well, in the Middle East, there's, an eye, there's a gate called the needle gate, and for the camel to go through it, he has to get on his knees and crawl through and then stand up on the other side. That may be true. Others say, well, what the Lord actually meant was a sewing needle, and you know camels can't go through the eye of a sewing needle. Either case, the focal point is, the, the point is, it's hard for people that have things that are between them and God to make it into the kingdom. And every one of us is in that category of rich by the description of the true witness, and his name is Jesus. Every one of us is rich in some area. If you don't think you're rich, start traveling around the world. Start going to countries where the water, you can't even see through the water, and people bathe in and drink the same water, as is the case in some third world countries. It's the same water that cows defecate in, and the sewage run off in, and people bathe in, and the diseases are so rampant that you can get sick by just breathing the atmosphere. And you come back home and lay in your bed and tell me you're not rich. 
or go to a thatched hut in Africa, as we did, that's made of cow dung and dirt. But if a really good rainstorm comes, that house ceases to exist. And they have a hole in the wall of their house that they covered up with cardboard, and there are no functioning lights in there except a small candle in the corner. And they all live on things that are made of straw and wood that's really not symmetrical, and they are smiling like they have a castle. That's why I like to travel. Sometimes it reminds us of the valuable things of life. We went over to Africa and unloaded all. We sat in our room and cried when we were down in Zimbabwe. We sat in our room in Zambia. We sat in our room and cried, said, Lord, what's wrong with us? When we met an elder who didn't have, I gave him a pair of shoes and he cried and I said, what are you crying for? It's the first pair of shoes I've ever owned. We go to the market. They don't want money. They want white T-shirts. A white T-shirt go farther than an American dollar in the market in, Zimbabwe, in Zambia. They want white T-shirts and white socks. You bring a white T-shirt to a market where they sell these little trinkets and dolls and things they make out of wood. Boy, two T-shirts, two white T-shirts. How many of you have white T-shirts? And then we see people carving things with a, a power drill and the dust is just shooting up in their nostrils and we think, that is so unhealthy. OSHA would shut this place down. But they're smiling. And we think, what's wrong with us? What's wrong with us? And we give a child, children, a piece of gum and they don't know what to do with it because they've never seen a piece of gum. So they chew it for two seconds and swallow it. We say, no, no, no. Bubble. Bubble? Bubble what? Or we give them a balloon and their eyes explode with, I've never seen a balloon that size. We have them on video running after each other just to touch that balloon. You give a kid in America a balloon for Christmas. <laughs> Whatever happened to Elder so-and-so? Well, he got nailed to the back of the house by his son. He gave him a red balloon for Christmas when he really wanted the latest, greatest, fastest digital gigahertz, megahertz gaming system. You want to see the time of trouble? Go to Toys R Us during Christmas. The diagnosis of us today is one of the reasons why our Christianity is not at an 8, 9, or 10, is Revelation 3, verse 17. We should be at an 8, 9, with the knowledge that God has given to this church, our spiritual fervor should be at an 8, 9, or 10. Look at the reason why it's not, Revelation 3, verse 17. Because you say, I am rich, I have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and what? And naked. It is a, the sad reality of this text is he is saying, this is how you think you are, but this is how you really are, and you don't know how you really are. Isn't that a messed up? That's messed up. So in the case of the rich young ruler and the church of the last days, the question is the same. Now here we're going to go into the psychological part of the sermon. Why settle for less? The number one reason why people settle for less, let me ask you some questions. Why do people settle for less when Jesus came to give us more? Why do people see eternal life as a liability and they see eternal death as an asset? Why do, pe why do we default to bad choices when the good benefits of the good choices are right before us? Three major reasons. Reason number one, faulty thinking. Say that together with me. Faulty thinking. What's faulty thinking? Listen to this. When perceived value distorts actual value. When things of lesser value are preferred above things of greater value. 
Here's why. Because our repetitive life choices have conditioned us to think that things of lesser value are more important than things of greater value. That is messed up. There's a terminology used in psychology. I may have written it down here, but one psychologist talks about, she says, she said the behavior that, that have held some of us is we find ourselves in this place where we are f afraid of failure, but we are even more terrified of success. That's why these three counsels are vi vitally important. Luke 12 and verse 15. Look at the way that Jesus brought these out. He brought these out. Faulty thinking, faulty thinking. Faulty thinking, illustrated over and over in the New Testament. And this applies to the generation today. If somebody said, get rid of everything you have, and over here I'm going to give you eternal life and everything you ever needed, and then in the world to come you'll have riches untold. That would be hard for us in this generation of materialism to even fathom making that kind of transaction. Look at what Jesus said in Luke 12 and verse 15. And he said to them, Take heed and beware of what? Covetousness. For one's life, here it is, does not consist in what? The abundance of the things he possesses. Gloria Vanderbilt died this year. The real estate mogul died last year. That's right. Died last year. The real estate mogul, the mother of Anderson Cooper on CNN, some say her worth was $200 million at the time of her death. Others say that this lady who owns so much, her worth dwindled down to $1.5 million because he said Anderson Cooper inherited $1.5 million in cash after his mother's death. No one really knows, but the point of the matter is whether you are wealthy or poor, when you die, your wealth can do you absolutely no good. Vanderbilt, Gloria Vanderbilt in New York. Man, she's very well known. Gloria Vanderbilt? People have buildings with their name on it. You drive along the West Side Highway, Trump has so many buildings with his name on it. Trump, 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 Trump. Towers all over the place. Let me tell you, my brothers, the Lord is saying, my sisters, the Lord is saying, be careful when the things around you make you seem to be larger than life, and then you ignore life itself because you think that your accoutrements naturally entitle you to eternal life. What is this text saying? When abundance seems more valuable than lack. When abundance seems more valuable than lack. What the Lord is in essence saying is lack is really more abundant than abundance. Because if the power goes out, the guy that's in West Frankfurt sitting on the curb with a cup, you know how much he's lost? Nothing. Doesn't have a house to burn down, don't have a bank account to crash. That's why poor people, when the stock market goes up or down, they say, we're going to go to the beach because they don't really care, right? But it's those very, very wealthy people. How's the stock market doing today? And you see them on the plane. Stock market, right? Oh, it went down 2%. Oh, it went up 5%. Oh. Now, I'm happy because I want to retire with a good retirement. Anybody can say amen with me? But let me make it, make, let me make it clear. My retirement is on the shoulders of Jesus. He's the one that promises to provide every need I have according to his riches and glory. The second reason for faulty thinking is in 1 Timothy 6.6. 6. Look at this. 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, faulty thinking. Faulty thinking makes us think that having more is better than having less, when in fact, no matter what category you're in, you can't take it with you. 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, a very short passage. Now godliness with contentment is what, church? Great gain. Here is faulty thinking. When godliness does not bring contentment, when godliness does not bring contentment, I read a story just reading. I'm going to share this story with you tonight. I want you to come. This story tonight, I'll just give you just a hint of it, of a young Spanish man who wanted Bible study so badly, 
He walked for hours in 100 degree plus weather to go to see a pastor and three times in a row the pastor lost his phone number. And the pastor described, he said, you know what bothered him when he eventually baptized this young man? He said, what bothered him is this young man's passion to know about Christ was greater than my passion to want to share Christ with him. Because I, as a pastor, fell into the rut. And I did not think that his hours of walking in 100 degree plus weather, asking me question after question, was important enough. But to him it meant everything. When we were in India, not too many years ago, I was told by the people that took us over there, they said, now tonight, there are going to be people that are Hindu and Buddhist that are coming tonight to hear you speak. All they know is that a Christian pastor is going to be speaking tonight at that school, and they have been walking for hours to get there. And when I came to speak, there they were lined up with their chain connected from their head to their nose, all the accoutrements of the gods that they serve. And after I spoke, they all walked to me and said, pray for me, 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 pray for me. And they said, when they hear that a Christian is in this community, they will walk for hours just to hear about a God that they don't know. Godliness with contentment is great gain. The third thing that leads to faulty thinking is in Luke 8 and verse 14. Look what happens. Luke 8 and verse 14. The second one is when godliness does not bring contentment. The third one is when we merge with environmental pressures. When we merge with environmental pressures. In other words, we start living like the world around us wants us to live. Luke 8 and verse 14. Now the ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they have heard, they go out and are choked with cares. What else? Riches and what else? Pleasures of life and what? Bring no fruit to maturity. 2020 ought to be the year when our, fruit, our fruits become more mature. So we're going to outline how that can happen. We're going to outline how you can find complete success, how you can find complete contentment in things where your life is lacking at the present time. Psychology Today... October 10th, 2017, Dr. Ellen Hendrickson said, as she describes self-sabotage behavior, she calls it cognitive dissonance. She says, because of how we view ourselves, we view ourselves flawed, worthless, incapable, or deficient. And she says, our victories and accomplishments don't change our behavior. It makes us feel bad to fail and even worse to succeed. Cognitive dissonance. When we, when we have turned the right priority in the wrong direction and the wrong priority in the distorted direction, and when we see somebody saying, do you want eternal life? They say no. Do you want to live forever? They say no. Do you want to give your life completely to Christ? They say no. Because cognitive dissidents out of repetitive behavior have trained our brains to make bad decisions, and it just cannot get beyond our ability to make one choice. But she says, as it goes on, she says, but this is not the end result because all a person that is locked in cognitive dissonance has to do is make one good choice and stick with it. And the brain says, wait a minute. You want to do that instead? And the brain starts participating. Praise God, it is not true that an old dog cannot learn new tricks. No matter what your age, the Bible is saying your brain has still been created with the ability to learn something new. So you may look like an old dog, but you can learn new tricks. <laughs> Amen? What's the remedy for repetitively choosing wrong things? You have to change the way you see yourself. Say that with me. You have to do what? Change the way you see yourself. First Peter 2 verse 9. Let's go quicker now. I'm going to wind up in a few minutes. 1 Peter 2, verse 9, you have to change the way you see yourself. We have to begin to see ourselves the way that God sees us. We have to repetitively choose to see ourselves as God sees us. 1 Peter 2, verse 9, how does God see us? Here's what he says. But you are a what? Come on. 
chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into what? Marvelous life. Is the message we have marvelous? Is this message marvelous? Is the Lord we serve marvelous? Then why is the life you're living not marvelous? That's why when little successes happen, when we hear people make this and make that and they're famous here and they're famous there, that's why it sparks us so much because we tend to connect to people that are successful because in many cases we experience so little success in ourselves, yet we know it's possible. So when we see it in somebody else, we say, wow, I'd like to meet that person. Well, I like what Pastor Bird, Pastor, uh, Bird, uh, uh, Pastor Bird from Oakwood University said, Pastor Carlton Bird. He was on a plane sitting with his daughter, and he was in first class, and his daughter saw a rap artist. She said, Daddy, look, he's a famous rapper. I want to meet him. And he said, for a brief moment, I thought, okay, I'll try to find a way for you to meet him. But he said, all of a sudden, the Lord spoke to me and said, wait a minute, wait a minute. That rapper needs to be saying he wants to meet us because we serve the real God. Come on, help me out. But, but cognizant dissonance says he's famous, you're not. He doesn't serve God, you do. He's famous and you're not? Let me tell you something. God doesn't call us to be famous. He calls us to be faithful, and the world is not the measuring rod by which that is established. So when I see people that are famous, I say, they ought to know who I work for, right, Eva? I work for God. I had a sticker on my forerunner, an old one. It said on the back, on a mission. And every time I stopped to get gas and somebody saw that, it said, you're on a mission for who? I said, on a mission from God. And that mission would never fail. Amen, Jason? So reason number two. First one is faulty thinking. I only have one more, so hang with me. Reason number two, fear of rejection. Fear of rejection. Listen to what she describes. When we don't believe that God will receive us in the condition, in the condition that we are in, we default to thinking that we need time to work on making ourselves more valuable before we can come to Christ. We live self-defeating, we live with self-defeating guilt, a low appraisal of ourselves, and then we enter into a seemingly endless journey of failed attempts to make ourselves better. The end result is we stop trying to please God. Because we think if we don't come to him with all of our marbles in the row, then he is not going to accept us. The reality is we don't see ourselves the way that God sees us. Look at Acts chapter 10 and verse 28. We see ourselves low and of no value, but look at how God sees us. Look at how God sees us. God had to fix Peter's attitude because Peter had the same challenge. Acts 10, 28. Then he said to them, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. We're going through that same issue in our nation right now. We think, well, if this, is, if this person is of that nationality, keep them out. If they're of that nationality, let them in. Oh, my brothers and sisters, that should never be among those who claim that God is their father. But he says in verse 28, but God has shown me that I should not call any man what? Common or unclean. When we are in Christ, we are not common. We are children of the Most High God. Am I right? The other one is Isaiah 61, verse 1 to 3. We fail to understand the mission of Jesus. Briefly look at that. What is the mission of Jesus? He came to transition us, take away our fear of rejection. Look at these words. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Look at what he came, came to do. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach what? Good tidings to the poor. He sent me to do what else? Heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. In other words, God will fight your battles to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Summarized, when God plants you, you can't help but to bloom to his glory. Summarized, when you are planted in Christ, 
you cannot help but to bloom to his glory. These are not real. We live in an unreal world that have created things to make you look like you're alive when in fact you're dead. But when Jesus Christ is the point to which you're connected, he is the promise he makes to us. Ezekiel 36, 26. Look at this. The remedy for this fear of rejection is come to Jesus as you are and he will make the change. Don't wait. Here it is. Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a what kind of heart? A new heart and what else? Put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a what? Heart of flesh. And I want to read this quotation before the last point. From Prophets and Kings, page 233. The Lord is going to make the change. He's going to take those old things out and put new things in. In 2020, we should look for new things, make ourselves available to the God who wants to change us and make us new all over again. Look at the promise. Prophets and Kings 233. To the heart that has become purified. Has become what? Purified. All is changed. How much? All is changed. Transformation of character is the testimony to the world of an indwelling Christ. When the world sees us differently, they say, wait a minute, there's something about that person. I don't want to, I don't want to toot my own horn, but I have to give you some examples. Two ladies ran, jumped in front of me in a medical clinic. When they told me, go upstairs and get your records, and when you come back down, walk straight to the front of the line. Well, two or three ladies jumped in front of me in a medical clinic. I had the right. Excuse me. To walk to the front of the line. I stayed at the back of the line. Angie was already behind the desk in the room where they were waiting for these files to be drawn. And the nurse said to her, Is your husband a Christian in San Francisco? Is he a Christian? She said, yeah, why? She said, because normally, I, I told him just to come to the front. Of the Nobody would go to the back of the line and wait like he is. He should have just come right to the front of the line. I waited. I waited. I got to the front of the line. Let me make a point. When your life is transformed, people in public see it. She says, the Spirit of God produces a new life in the soul bringing the thoughts and desires into obedience to the will of Christ. And the inward man is renewed in the image of God. Listen to how it ends. Weak and erring men and women show to the world that the redeeming power of grace can cause the faulty character, what kind of character? The faulty character to develop into a symmetry, a symmetry, an abundant example of fruitfulness. They said, wow, what a life. And I would say to you, just before I close, one of the reasons why more Christians are not where Christians are is because they're waiting to see in Christians something worth grabbing onto. They want to embrace something that they don't yet see. The last reason why we settle for less is procrastination and avoidance. What is it? Procrastination and avoidance. What does that mean? According to psychologists, they say, when we think that time, what did I just say? Time and opportunity are in our favor. And that, we, and that we can avoid the right decision until the right time eventually comes. You know the problem with that? Is according to the procrastinator, the right time never comes. Psychology Today, June 11, 2018. Melanie Greenberg, PhD, she says... Procrastination and avoidance can also be ways of not taking responsibility for your actions. People procrastinate because they don't want to take responsibility. They don't want to take responsibility that they can change, so they keep avoiding and putting it off. She goes on to say, these behaviors allow you to blame outside factors, like not having enough time, you may also procrastinate and avoid because you are a perfectionist. You think you have to become perfect before you can move forward and you cannot decide where to begin. 
And all of these tendencies make us people of hesitancy and a life filled with anxiety. You can get rid of your anxiety if you simply give your life to Jesus. This week, I'm going to invite the praise team to come out. And when they come out, I'll give you the remedy. I'll give you the remedy for procrastination. I want to get them in place. This week, the list of all the famous people that died in 2019 was published. Did any of you see it? Depending on the network you saw, the list was amazing. I'm a New Yorker. Yvonne might remember Don Imus in the morning. Don Imus, a very famous radio voice. They said when Don Imus died, he was a national radio personality from 1977 to 2018. Every morning, Don Imus in the morning. They said when he died, his net worth was $75 million at the time of his death. He died at 79 years old, and not a single penny of his money could have canceled his death date. I was moved by the story. A 21-year-old man, he's a rapper, very well known, just coming up. His name is Juice World. He died in the airport in Chicago Midway Airport as his private jet landed. He went into cardiac arrest in a private airplane hangar in his jet was transported to an, a local hospital where he died at 21 years old. Just getting started. Young people were going crazy over Juice World. He died with a beginning estimated $4 million net worth. But he died. Another young man named Cameron Boyce, 20 years old, starring in a lot of the Disney movies. Just getting off the ground, 20 years old. One day he had an epileptic fit in his bed at home. Died, 20 years old. Net worth five million. There are others like Doris Day, died at 97. Tim Conway, 85. Luke Perry, 52. And a very famous writer, a lady of great foundation and great literature capability, Toni Morrison, died at 88. What struck me about all these people that died is you know what? Not one of us in here know our death date. Not a one of us. Why settle for less when there's so much more? The prophet said, for we brought nothing into this world and it is certain that we will carry nothing out. I'm just going to go down to the last scripture, Matthew 19, 29, and 30. The remedy for procrastination and avoidance is don't delay Today is the day of salvation. When is it? Today. Today is the day to decide. My 2020, if the Lord gives me a tomorrow and the next day and the next day, I'm going to spend my days intentionally, purposefully designing a spiritual, social, mental, and physical life. I want to wake up in the morning driven with passion. Cannot wait to get out of my bed and contribute one more thing to a temporary world that when my name is no longer mentioned, they say, oh, we remember him. We remember her. And when we live purposefully, it will be said of us as Revelation chapter 14, verse 13, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. I don't know how much time I have. I don't know what kind of world we have. I don't know if the Jesus is going to come when I'm alive. But if he doesn't, I want my works to continue to say that I live for an eternal purpose. Jesus said to the young man, Peter, verse 29 and 30, in Matthew 19, everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold when? Now. Why settle for less? and inherit eternal life. But many who are first that make the world their pursuit will end up last. And those who to the world's standards look last will be first because they've lived their lives to make their choices in the eyes of God. Why settle for less? It might feel exciting, look exciting, sound exciting, 
but it's just icing on a cake that leads to destruction. 